Line 12 to 13. You found a very interesting story. It talks about what the Hebrew refers to as Ut, which is a distinguishing mark, or a Berith, which is a covenant. And that this covenant is being made with the seed of the prophet Noah, who we know as the fish tomb. All right? What is it about, and how does it relate to you? And that's a deep story. Because this part of the Bible is not really very really clear to most people. Why did God, as they say, put a rainbow in the sky? They say, well, it was a sign that he would no longer destroy the earth by water, but more by fire. However, it's a little deeper than that. It takes you back to Rizk and what took place on Rizk, a planet that most people want to pretend is not their home. But it's fine, because it's mentioned in your Quran, and it's mentioned in the Bible. Look at it like this. Genesis um, 9-12, they speak about this rainbow, which they call uh, Keshish in Hebrew, which implies a bow. If you look that up in Old English, you get boga or curvature, which is symbolic of some type of dome-shaped thing over or around a biosphere. A biosphere is, as you know, they're making biospheres for the scientists to go into to see if they can survive on the plants, that which they've already accomplished and are already doing. All right, well, why do they have these biospheres, and why are they attacking other planets? Why are they going to other planets? Why are they so interested in the moon and haven't even solved the problems on Earth? Why are they interested in Jupiter and haven't solved the problems on Earth? And why are they so interested in Mars, the space on Mars, is there life on Mars? Something I mentioned before that now they're confirming, and they haven't even solved the ecology problems, the environment problems, the disease problems, the bacteria problems, and the very temperament of the creatures that walk this planet Earth. Why? Of course, they call them shuttles. What is a shuttle? A shuttle is a shuttle one in and out of a place. Why do they still have shuttle flights? There's no more conflict between the United States and Russia, which I always told you was, was a, a false accusation anyway, because USSR abbreviates United States and Soviet Russia. They've always been working together. This has been going on way since the first book written by Hitler called The New World Order. But let me just tell you the real reason and what's really taking place. Now sit back and check this out now. This is, you call me crazy after, but it's deep. I, you look at that curvature, that dome, and that biosphere, a planet can survive if the, uh, let's say, the elements from outside that planet's atmosphere can be dangerous to them, like gamma rays and ultraviolet rays. They need some type of shield to protect them. As I told you, the Rizkians, we needed a shield to protect us because there was an explosion on our planet that depleted our, what's referred to in your planet, as ozone layer. And the rays of our three suns were coming through and killing people. So we had to evacuate our planet. Project evacuation and go to Plates and go to Orion and then set up on Mars and start rebreathing again. And you're the product of that Homo sapiens. And as I go, every biosphere or dome or rainbow is no more than a protection against some kind of a ray, like I said. It's like a, an enclosure. Now, think about this. You have elements and you have forces that can do you bodily harm, that can actually burn you up. Okay? It says, right there, that's in Genesis uh, 9, 12, that these Elohim put a symbol in the sky and called it a rainbow. A rainbow is no more than an arc, or arc, a curvature. Right? And what does a rainbow consist of? But seven individual colors. Right? And as you look up in the sky, you see as a rainbow, one red, two orange, three yellow, four green, five blue, six indigo, and of course the most important seven is violet. Note the rainbow has seven colors, and it comes from the direct rays of the sun as it hits the prism and breaks down, or it bends into that light. Curvature again. Now, this rainbow was actually no more than a dome of seven spheres. That's right. A dome of seven spheres. Spheres is nothing but a Greek word for ball or curvature again. But, which is a solid figure, it represents something. It resembles something. It resembles a planet covered with a bunch of layers. What are these layers called? These layers are called the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the thermosphere, and above them then we have, we have what's called the ionosphere, the exosphere, and then, then the outer space. Did you know that there was also seven spheres, just like the seven colors of the rainbow? What does that mean in relation to you? <laughs> it's 
so, check this out. So now, if it wasn't for your spheres, the rays of the sun would penetrate and kill you dead. Is that correct? What is it protecting you against? It's protecting against something called ultraviolet and gamma rays. You notice that it's called ultraviolet and the last color on the rainbow is called violet? And these rays are coming directly from your sun, right? And if they penetrate this sphere, there's nothing that can protect you, you're dead. So as a sign to open the fish, the elders that created you called the Anunnaki or the Elohim had to put a dome or a set of seven domes, six to seven domes, you should say, around this plant to protect you from the sun, let there be light as it says. If they didn't, it was true. Just like the gold dome that we had to construct over it, the same thing is now being done here on earth. These demons, these Luciferians, they know exactly what they're doing. You with me? They know what I'm saying. They know exactly what they're doing with these aerosol cans and these explosions. Didn't they start exploding things when? In 19 what? 45. All between the early 40s is when they started testing these bombs, and that's when they started getting all the so-called UFO visitation. The CIA wasn't created in 1947, the FBI in 1933, but there were secret societies already existing. They didn't incorporate themselves and start practicing and make themselves public into them. They had to create institutions and societies to protect the public from getting certain information. They call them Federal Bureau of Investigation. They have all these titles that they created to make themselves public to justify the things they got to do, to cover up certain information, which is their prerogative because they are in control of this plan and they're so-called protecting the plan. But as these people are exploding these things and creating all these aerosol cans, you are having a depletion in the ozone layer. The ultraviolet rays, note, the similarity now between the rainbow violet and the word ultraviolet rays, the ultraviolet rays are going to come through the gamma. The ozone contains a relatively high concentration of ozone that absorbs solar ultraviolet radiation in a wavelength of a range. Now this is the scheme of things. This is how it's planned. By destroying the ozone layer, the rays come through and all life as they know it on Earth in human form will begin to die. These deadly rays are now starting to come through. When you go buy glasses, they ask you, would you like a shield in your glasses against the rays? They got these blue blockers, all these different things they're trying to tell you. Who's it for? You? No, it's for their people. You say, well, wouldn't this kill them as well? That's why it's called, as I said before, alternative three. They have reached the third alternative. The first alternative was to build underground cities here. And as they went down, they tapped into caverns and encountered the Dunaco, the Tiru, the Diru. These seem like mythological creatures to you. As you go to China, you find a Diru. They call them the Ganesh. Now they found the skull of a, a head with two croniums, scientists. That's the Dunaco. Oh, the obesity that was called, that obesity of people who are over fat, over, overactive glands, that's a part of the rules. They have a whole movie, and they think because they introduced you Saturday Night Live to a family called the, um, what do they call those people with those pointed heads? Coneheads. Right, that's what they call coneheads. They think if they put that in the movie, you'll say, when you see it in a real book about the, Oh, they made that stuff up. They did the same thing with the predator and the creature from the Black Lagoon. These are all what they have captured and they make replicas of them. They create these things for what they've already had. And they put them in the movies and you say, well, see in the book that I put out of the car, he's copying that stuff out of a You're the one that's being fooled. These people have a, what they call this, the one, two, three degree. First alternative was to go underground. And, and I've shown you in most of the books, underground cities. But they encountered extraterrestrials already living there, reptilians, graves, shaggies, already here, and they can't stay there. They'll invade them. The next alternative was genetic annihilation, which Dr. Francis Welsting always talked about. 
how they must eliminate us because we populate too fast. Don't you see there's something divine in us? What do you think Jordan is? Jordan is not jumping. Jordan is almost flying. We can fly. We got fighters. Look at a holy field. Look at Tyson. Look at Muhammad Ali. Look at Sugar Ray Robinson. Look at Sugar Ray Leonard. Look at Holmes. Look at Frazier. Look at the kind of stuff. We got the greatest of everything. We are the youngest heavyweight champion in Tyson and the oldest in Foreman. We are supernatural. We are able to adjust to a situation. They made a mistake and now they got some young Nubians in golf and they're taking over golf. All the ass was taking over tennis. We take over everything we get into. We're taking over the stock market. We took over the music industry. We're taking over the movie theater. That's why they're suppressing all these Nubian movies that have come out and they want to turn us into cartoons. Everything is funny. Everything is a joke with us because the, the Nubian producers, like the Hubbard brothers, are getting too deep for them. They want to stop. They see anything we put our hands on as God, we master it. Is it not written in your law? I said, we are God. Ain't that what the scripture said? I didn't say that. Jesus said, you want to kill me because I said, you are God. And he was quoting John from the book of Psalms, where it declares you are God. A walking and talking, a breathing, a eating, a sleeping God. When I say that I am God in flesh, I don't mean me exclusively. When I say I am the Lamb, I don't mean the, the only Lamb. All of you are lambs and you're being sent out against wolves. All of you are children of the Elohim. Jesus said, as many as believe on my name, to them I give the power to become the sons of God. And when he said God, he said, Eli, Eli, Lamech, and Bethany. According to them, this is what he said. He copied that out of the psalm, the 22nd psalm. Eli, what is Eli? But Allah, or Eli, or Elo, of one of the Elohim. That's you. You are the God in flesh. It's time for you to stop thinking you're a man. Because man is number one degree above a beast and an animal. Crime on crime is because you have wasted time. Gangs come together, that's a tribal thing. That's our nature, that we work together. But now they turn it against us. They bred those gangs. They put those movies, colors, and the kids, the neighborhoods, and the hood boys in the hood. They did all that. They know they're doing that. Keep us divided. We are the about their devilish men. Now, alternative two was genocide. If it wasn't through drugs or heroin, then they came up with methadone, and then it's crack, and if they keep us drugged, or they keep us drinking all kind of alcohol, wasted on cheap wine, or they keep us burning our brains out in discotheques and clubs and loud, puffed up and why do you think I went in there? Why do you think Dr. York was created? Why well, I was called Dr. York while living in New York. I went into the music business because Muslims and Hebrews and everybody who's religious gets so self-righteous, no one wants to go out there and get the people. And I had to take off my sackcloth, my holy garb, nightly and weekly so I can go into clubs. Or you can say, Dr. York, the disco singer. Dr. York, the song, 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 while you're listening to my music. I went in. If I wanted to become a big star, I could have done it. Millions of people like my music. I didn't do it because I wasn't what I was in there for. I was in there to reach the kids. And I did, because many thousands of my followers met me through being Dr. York. And I touched their hearts and changed their lives. There was no drugs and passion. There wasn't no alcohol or drinking and passion. And we had passion fans, but they came and they had wholesome, clean fun. We had picnics and parties, and we pumped into them the right now. The doctor, he did something for their lives. You can't say that's what you do. Didn't Jesus say he, he went up amongst the people? And didn't his disciples get mad because he went amongst prostitutes, he went amongst drunkards, he went amongst... That's, that was my job. That's why I was called passion. We are men of like passion. Look that up in the Bible. That's the kind of things I did. And that's the kind of things I do. And that's the kind of things you'll have to do. Because you are God in the flesh. You've got to take your position again. Stop thinking like a man or man's kind. Start thinking like a God and become responsible for your environment. And I tell you, alternative two did not work. Because we were the only people that could overthrow heroin and then get our lives together and join the nation of Islam or join the more science that we would stop using the most addictive drugs. Overthrow it. That's God in us. The divine in us dominated. The physical was weak. Like Jesus said, my flesh is weak, but what? My spirit is divine. But his flesh was weak. They had our flesh. 
they had us under drugs. They had us listening to music all night, gang fighting, beating each other up, uh, finger waving out here. They had us. But the divine in us, when a genetic explosion took place at the opening of the seal, bang! <laughs> God come out. You hear me? Are you with me? Y'all follow me? Yeah. Just happened here. Look at the little babies being born. Them large big heads, them bright eyes. Those are God incarnated. It is now our time. Our cycle, the sun cycle, the moon is going out. The moon is the sun cycle. Yeah, oh, there is new age. What do you mean by new age? Is there such thing as old age except weakness and the next step to death? You're admitting that this is a new age because you're admitting that the age you lived in was old. And it reached old age and it died. So now this time when I'm for birth and rebirth is new age. It's the new cycle, sun cycle. Our time. Now, what was the last alternative? Alternative three. Alternative three was I couldn't go beneath the earth as one. I couldn't eliminate these gods and keep on multiplying like roaches. <laughs> right? So turn to three and let's get them out of here. Let's get out of here. And that's why their whole conversation, they're bankrupt spending billions and billions of dollars trying to get out of here. But meanwhile, they gotta figure out a way to take your guns and press you to get you under have you under so much what is the word? It's called crisis. The word Christ. Crisis. Krishna, Christ, crisis, chaos to keep you so confused. There's always something in the media to keep you so preoccupied with what's going on in the world that you can't think. That your divinity is suppressed. They got us all fighting against each other. And Nation of Islam don't like the HTM and, and the HTM don't like the 5%, the 5 percent don't like the voice sign. It's a game, it's a plot to divide and conquer. We accept everybody in our tents as they are. You can come and sit amongst us with the stars of the Moorish scientists or with the bow tie and the star crest of the nation of Islam or with the seven and the star of the Bible Center. We don't care. We come as long as we stay right with that. And we all sit together and do what we are as a family. It's like the of Israel. They all came together, right? They sat down. They all, all had different doctrines. The Levites had a different doctrine than the Danites. And they didn't even give the Dinaites a 13th type of place. But we have a place for all that. We can solve it. All of us come together and start from one place. We have our own language, baby. As you heard in the beginning of the church, your language is here, set down to us, nobody else. So now when alternative two did not work, they started trying to get out of here. And they're succeeding. They already have a mind team on other planet. Or they're just making it known to you now. But I told you they were going to do that. 1996, they're going to reveal UFOs to you. This happening. <laughs> Am I the man or what? Am I the man? Am I the man? I'm going to look at the thing they're going to All they want to do is get in the tricks and play the poly game. Politics. Politics fall up under the five P's. I mean, the five P's go all the way back when Saul, who was S, changed his name to Paul, which is P. And from there, Pope, 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 Pope. Politics, 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 politics. Politism, politism, politism. Politics, politics, politism. Pope, prison, poison, penal system, psychology. That's all the big game. The five P's. I've been talking about it for years. And most of the come on and say, we have the five pillars of faith. Five P's. And then they make the first two pillars one. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulullah They try to make like that one pillar, and that's two. That's two separate sentences. They don't have five, they have six. But they don't want to deal with the number six, because that's signs at the end of their time. You had two stars in the sky, the five-pointed star and the six-pointed star. The five-pointed star is a symbol of a man is a six-point of penis. Don't fool yourself, it's not a tail. All human beings have a small tail called a coccyx. The five-pointed star is a female. That's why the Eastern stars and the MGT use a five-pointed star. They know it represents a female, but a star is an illusion because it's not there. The crescent is an illusion because it does not. You look up and see the moon, you don't see anything because all it's doing is reflecting the light of the sun. It's an illusion. So the, the whole of a star and a crescent thing, this is our symbol, the universe, it's all about us. That is an illusion. That's an illusion, as if, just like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the blue sky is an illusion. You can keep going up there, and it's not blue. The sun is not red. That's not true. The sun is helium and hydrogen. It's not the color red. That's an illusion. All of those are pantheism. All of those are the religions given to you by the Guru, the Greeks, as they call themselves. The Hebrew, or the Phoenician breed of them, or the 11 seed of Canaan. You want to get the 11 seed of Canaan? The six-pointed star and the five-pointed star. The two symbols that they use, five and six, 11. The 11 seed of Canaan, only one of them, the Hamathites, were Nubians. And that's the ones that the people in the Moorish Science Temple are wise enough to grab onto. Alternative three, getting out of here. When? After they destroy the ozone layer, 
and the ultraviolet rays come through. They're telling people now, don't go to beaches, it's too hot. Who do you think is causing all the climatic problems on the planet? The motion of the sun and that time of 48,000 years when the crust of the planet shifts. You gotta watch that. And the motion of 26,000 years when the axis needle makes its circumference. You gotta watch that. And the equinox. All these alignments are taking place now, May 5th, 2000. August 12th, 2000 feet. The board is open. Preparations are made by those who know who the man is. I'm the only one who's telling you about it. Everybody else is trying to get you caught up in politics and giving you this illusion of a long time future. Because they don't have the answers and too, too full of pride to come on over. I'm telling you that the elders created a sphere to protect your planet and to protect you from the sun the same way we did in risk. And it's called in your Bible a rainbow, a covenant of a rainbow. And when that rainbow is gone, also by the way, when the court of revelation starts to flee from you, you it, you're going to look for death, and death is going to flee from you. People's bodies are going to be covered in sores. This is starting to happen now. Famine, disease, pestilence, Matthew 24, it's happening now. The Quran is a no message for none of that. The Quran ain't talking about none of it. And the sections like Surat al-Aryat, the Ja or Zilzal, the one of the horsemen, or the earthquake, they tried to warn them, they try to interpret all kinds of stupid ways, they don't want to see what it really means. The last revelation of the Quran to them is Surah al That last chapter, that's the, not, not Surah al Nas, not Surah al Falak that they have as the last two chapters, but the Surah called the aiders or the helpers. That's why we called ourselves Ansar, in recognition of the last chapter. When you see the aid is coming, that aid is, those deers, those nafs of Allah there, <laughs> that is the Anunnaki, the Elohim. When you see them crabs coming, what? When you start seeing them coming, what? That's what it is. You better come together in groups. You better come together in groups. And that you're supposed to do what? Give all sabbah li rabika. To your sustainer, your rabbi, rabbika, your rabboni. I'm here, I am the rabboni right here amongst you. And I'm the one who gave you an answer. Ya ayyul al-ladina amanu kunu ansar Allah, is what we say. Nasr Allahi wal The opening of the seventh seal, 1970. There's a chance for you to tawa, to repent now. Stop following men that don't know. Chance you to get together now, because the help has come. The Anunnaki has opened us up in all those old time religions that have to go. The new era is in. You write, this is the new age, because you are old age, decrepit, and dying. What you teach is outdated. You have nothing new to say. And I said many times, the only definite thing in this universe is change. And if you're not a part of change, then you are dead. You are mummified. And you must be resurrected, Lazarus. That's what I have to say. Alternative three. They are getting out of here, and they're going to let you die. And I have connection with that mother plane. I have connection with Medellin. The craft is across the sky. Listen to the word Hebrew. Medellin. Hebrew. What is Hebrew from Eber? One who crosses over. It is. One who crosses over. What is Medellin? To cross the sky. One who crosses the sky. Wake up, y'all. No more sleeping in bed. No more backwards thinking. Time for thinking ahead. Or so turn your feet. The sign of the rainbow of Genesis is the sign that they put a dome over the planet Earth. <laughs> you see how simple it is when you know to protect you from the rays coming in. Meanwhile, the devil on the inside here, you see, is trying to destroy it. And I am here to teach you how to get out of here and not be left here to burn. Burn and burn. All right, now, what other teacher is preparing you like that? Everybody else is talking about some heavenly abode you're going to go to, something unconfirmed, some unreality. That's not what I'm doing. Is that what it sounds like I'm doing? I'm here telling you how to get out of an oncoming condition of judgment, as they want to call it. I'm not trying to tell you how to go into some garden which you already have here. 
Jannah. I'm not trying to tell you how to go into a paradise with rivers and streams and lakes and little black-eyed maidens or angels walking around feeding with green and gold robes and velvet counters as the Islamic world or Islamism teaches. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm not here to give you no fake dream. I'm here to bring you in contact with reality. I teach things that no one else teaches. I try to take you off to another level of thinking, don't I? For all the years that I've been teaching you, I stand before you and I constantly say over and over again, don't believe me, go check it out. I try not to throw out myths. I try not to throw out, throw out these stupid. And all that they did, the best that they could do against me was one cult book, and that didn't work. And they've been milking it and milking it and milking it. Dr. York, Dwight York, he's the passion man, he's the, the singer, he's this, and it just didn't work. Give it up. You cannot fight the forces of Nawapo, the power of the universe. It's an alignment. They're not ready for us. And we are here. They say you keep changing, you keep changing, you keep changing. And I keep saying, anything that does not change is dead. Anybody that tries to hold you down to some old 2,000-year-old religion or 1,400-year-old religion or even a 44-year-old religion is dead. They want you to go lay down and die. No, we are alive. We are people of the sun. And the sun of righteousness is here. And it's coming through. And they are going to be the ones that's going to suffer as they try to teach that goes on there. And we have to prepare for their coming. And that's why I would teach y'all about the science of altars. Let me introduce something new to you. Something, something else they don't know about. When you go back to Exodus, and they speak about it around Exodus 40, I think it's uh, the 40th chapter, 6th verse. And they start talking about the burning of altars. Remember every place that, what they refer to as Nebi Ibrahim or Abraham, or Abraham, every place Abraham, which is his real name, went, they always told him to make an altar so we could find you. And then we would appear to you, literally make ourselves seen to you in human form, these angelic beings, or Anunnaki, or Jabarians, or Gabor, or the Kachina of the Native Americans, or the Neturu of, you know, of the Egyptians. These are the same beings that have been coming from stars. These are your descendants, or your ancestors. That's what the of their descendants take. In order for them to find Abraham way out in the middle of nowhere, how did they do it? I'll tell you how. They made him light an altar, a burnt offering. It acted like a flare. Otherwise, they couldn't see him. They had to come from Kisil. It was coming from the Orion stars, Kima, from Pleiades. They came from Ish, Arcturus. And they were coming in there. These are star constellations you can find right now in any astrological chart. Have you researched it? Have you found out these things are true? Or does it sound like something I'm just telling you that the mother plane was there and you can't confirm it? And I tell you to point in some star that anybody can see in the sky and any astrological chart you can log what that star is. And I'm pretending that's not what I do. I tell you things and you go find them. They just faxed me this week in the internet the skull of a Danaco that the scientists found. The actual skull with the, with the crow in the side of two men. And I said it was found crazy. When I showed the picture of it, of him, inside the Holy Tablet, they thought I was a nut. But the scientists are behind me. They know I am an incarnation of divine Illumica Jessica, my avatar of some sort. They know who I am now. They know I am him. Dr. Salam got the Nobel Peace Prize from reading my book, Recently Died, a matter of a couple of weeks ago. Why? Because I'm here. And truth will make false things perish. Listen. He's burning false things. Listen, let's, let's just take a glance at what we see. We find that way out in the wilderness where Abraham or Moshe or Musa or Moses or something Moses, whatever you want to call him, when he had his congregation, there was no city lights. They had no flares. All they could do is light torches. And if these beings were trying to find them, notice in Exodus how they talk about them. At night, they appeared as light, and in the daytime, they appeared as pillars of smoke. This is the same thing the Native Americans would do when they wanted to signal each other. They had what we refer to as smoke signal. And they would burn carcasses of the bison, and they would see the smoke going up, and that's how, because a burned carcass gives a very thick smoke, and that's how other Native Americans would find them, and have ways of sending up signals to identify them. Well, right now, if a plane is trying to land in Kennedy Airport or Atlanta Airport, if they don't set up them lights, they won't find their way in. If I'm stranded out somewhere in the wilderness, you with me? And you want to find me, I got to shoot up a flare, and your plane will go by and see the flare, and then they can trace me, latitude and longitude, and there I am. 
Well, back then, when the elders were coming in on in their crafts, the makara, when they were bringing these shams in, what they would do is they would tell everybody how. How they tell them? They told them to build a tremendous radio, Arun. It's called a Ark of the Covenant, a big receiver so they can talk to them and they told them what to do. And so they were ordered to build this Ark of the Covenant. The elders would incarnate and communicate through that Ark and tell them this is what you do. Now Abraham was before the Ark of the Covenant, right? But they would tell Abraham, this is what you do. You go and build an altar of stone and there burn something. And in the night skies, they'll be flying through. They'll see the thing and you'll know that's the camp of Abraham and they come in. That's what burnt offerings are for. It wasn't because our Heavenly Father, Allah, Elohim, Adonai, Yahweh, Yahweh, Hashem, Alum, any name we want to call him, because he likes the smell of dead bodies, because he wants us to take little innocent animals and put them on altars and chop them up. No, leaves would not burn as fast. And they were in desert areas. There wasn't forests and trees. So they couldn't build a lot of timber. So they would tell them to take the flock, take from their flock and burn them, because when you burn that carcass, you get a thick black smoke. It was easy for them to find them by day. And then, when they wanted to find them by night, they would find them because they'd see the fire. And that's how the elders would be able to find their way to the camps of the Israelites and the Ishmaelites and the Midianites, those people, according to the Bible, that was chosen. According to the Bible believers that was chosen. And according to the Quranic believers that was chosen. And even Rasulullah Muhammad, as they called him, alayhi salatu wa salam, 1400 years ago, picked up that same Jewish tradition and has them burning altar. And Muslims are doing the same thing, which they copied from the Jewish tradition, burning carcasses and altars. When you start asking about these things, they don't know. They, you know the name they use for sacrifice? To cut. The word to cut something. That's all they know. And when someone says, where did this come from? They don't know. When you ask them about their salat, Worship. You say, why do you bow? Why ruku? Why sujud? Why prostration? They don't know. They don't know that the actual prayer is on the walls in Egypt. Every position that the Muslim takes is on the walls in Egypt. We went back. I have this in our form of salut called prayer. That's how we will perform our gratitude, not worship. You can call it worship or you feel like. We're not interested in the worship of the Maldicians, we're interested in the peace ship of the Nibelians, or the Kings from the Nibelians. That's what they're in common. Now what happened is, when I would teach all these weird types of teachings, guess what would happen? You're right. Everybody was mad at me. That guy's crazy, he's this, he's that, all kind of things. Why me? Why am I so disliked? Why do all the Nubians hate me? Let me tell you why all the Nubian leaders hate me, but they can tolerate each other in their silliness, their lies, and inconsistencies. But me, who they have not been able to prove wrong about anything, they spend their whole time in my personal life. Him, this, he did this, he was this, he was that, he wasn't born here. Well, who cares? I'm bringing right knowledge, truth. They can't handle that. You know why? Because I am agreeable, and they are disagreeable by nature. I am alike, and they are the unalike by nature, and they come toward me just to badger. They can't win. When I used to visit State Street a long time ago, the Ansar Allah community, or the Nubian Islamic Hebrews, or the pure suits, whatever you want to, whatever name we use to get where we're going, and don't lie, niggas, and pretend that y'all didn't change the name of your mom, or you didn't change the name of your community. Don't lie, you niggas are lying. Talking about, we say they changed their name, he changed his name. All you niggas had different names, and then y'all started changing them to Arabic names, and the first name you took when you probably took your shahada was one thing, and as you learned a little more about Islam, you changed it. So stop fronting, nigga, because everybody can see right through it. And then most of the niggas who was talking about me and bad enough me them fell out of Islam and they're back on the streets using drugs or working for the man that they was calling the devil. The same people, but me, all the way from 1970 to now, I'm still doing what I'm doing. We're all the leaders. We're all the imams that have so much to say about the Ansar Allah community. Them niggas in hiding. But I still have never addressed the fact that I said, I bet you you can't go marry one of them Saudi Arabian daughters, they'll write that book for you against me, a brother against a brother, but I bet you can't go marry one of them Arab girls. I'll go find out how much of their brother you are. Niggas, stop trying to be other people. We are. We were something created. They were all made. We are of the original. Those niggas are fake. They are all, they took our way of life, Islam, and desecrated it, and turned it into Sunni junk, and turned it into Ahmadiyya junk. And now they can't even get along. They don't, not only do they work, concentrate on us, they also concentrate on each other. 
You they hate the Baha'i, they hate the Ahmadiyya, they hate the nation of Islam, they hate the Wahhabi, they hate the Maliki, they got a school for everything, now they hate the Sufi. Them, those people just want to hate. Why? They are demons. They burnt the Quran, they, they destroyed the original Torah, they made up the Angel, they created a Paul, they created a Muslim, and they are a bunch of demons. And we need to break away from them to break the spell. We need to come among ourselves and do our own thing. And that's what happened back there in 1957. I was attending Stacey since 1957. 1957, fool, and it's on record. Stop creating crap that I just joined State Street in 1965 or 1969. 1957, it's on record in State Street. If you don't believe me, go check it out. If you don't want to know the truth, you just need that to, to support yourself so you can make money off the population, well, go ahead and do your devilishment. That's going to come around to you, too. But no, when I used to attend State Street years ago, you asked to answer. We had our own place out in Coney Island, our own congregation. You know what? I say, let's walk. They say, walk? From Coney Island to State Street? Ask the original answer. They say, Pop would walk you. I said, yeah, walking is the healthiest exercise any human being can do. This is what we did in our motherland, and this is what we should do now. Guess what? Here we are over 20-something years later, and Amorites are walking all over the country. They're jogging, and they're walking, and they got walking on. They didn't exist back then. What, did I know something? But the only people that were walking was us. And now when you look at the brothers of the Ansar, 40, 50 years old, people say, man, look like you're not aging. Hey, you guys look good. How come y'all look good? And a whole bunch of our brothers are not laying up in hospitals getting their kidneys removed and cancer and all kinds of diseases. Those brothers that walked with me and talked with me and ate the minimum amount of food that I put them on that special diet, right to this very day, they're all healthy old men. They're in good shape. Most of them, their hair is not all bleached out white. Teeth ain't falling all out their mouth. They ain't been back problems, leg problems. They did the job and it worked. And now we're a bunch of old men from young men still healthy. Now what we're doing is we build a nation and learn to do for self, like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us to do. Combine that with what Chef Dao taught us, which is they sell to everybody and buy from your own, and we're on the way to doing our own thing until the crafts come, because we got to light that altar. So they'll see, and you'll see them progress one day, like what a, a beacon for them to find their way here. And the rituals of the ancient that we'll be doing right here, for them to know it's us and hear the call. You don't have to be a part of it. You didn't have to be a part of it for all these years, and I still succeeded. You can turn your back, you can slander, you can gossip about my human person, you can do all that, but that won't stop the message and it won't stop the truth from going across. And if you don't have the truth, you do That's right. And so walk. We pedal. They called us the beggars. Those brothers out there begging, why don't y'all go get a job? Now they're out there begging. They're still in the same little storefront mall. They're still selling the same little trinkets and junk. They're still kissing up the Arabs who don't have no respect for them. They still can't speak fluent Arabic. They still haven't translated their own Quran after all these years. They don't have nothing. No school, no bank, no education, no transportation. They have absolutely nothing. And we have it all. With the help of the most high, they can take ten steps to us, and we took one step and we took ten to us. They need to take some type of step to do something instead of wasting their time. The, school, the money they spend on that stupid little cult book, they're going to open the school for some of their kids. But they'll never see that. They're not supposed to see it, because it's not their day and time. <laughs> so you go back and ask the original answer. Yes, we used to walk and walk and walk and beg and be on the trains now white. And we were doing more for the propagation of Islam than any of you phonies. And then the Pakistanians and the Egyptians and them came and just took over your whole lives and turned y'all into their pets. <laughs> y'all came to us. You're mad at me because I don't want to acknowledge a man named Farad because he don't look like me, because he doesn't have my hair texture, because he don't have nothing that pertains to me. He's not African. And he's going to tell me that Africans are all savages and I'm an African. He gonna try to play me down and tell me some I'm an Asiatic. I'm not no Asiatic. In the sense of what they call Asiatic. You wanna say I'm Asiatic in the sense that Asiatic black man by Noah. I could understand that the Mizraimites were the sons of Noah's sons and they migrated over to Egypt. I'll take that part of Asia, but don't try to tell me I'm no Asiatic black man, because I'm not even a black man. You want your black man, you go to India, you find your Asiatic black man. And he's black in the black man in Africa. And he got bone straight here, six ether. That is the Hindu. That is the one they're talking about. That's the one the devil's at war with. Then nothing to do with you. You're a god. That war is taking place between men and men. The original black man is a black-skinned, straight-haired man. If you really believe in the teaching of the one, that's what he told you. They had straight hair before they came that. We were here. We were older than what you're calling the sun, moon, and stars. 
Like I said, we are part of original creation. All them, those people are made. I'm no black man. Don't try to make me go against Mother Africa. Make Africa a place for savages. Africa is not a place for savages. Have you seen any pyramids in the Far East? The Chinese have a civilization, as they call it. The Chinese have had empires of great learning and building and fine art, and the Egyptians had it, and the Sumerians have it, but you don't find it anywhere else. India is based on a bunch of demons. Six and seven armed guards with blue skin and monkeys and worshipping cows and worshipping snakes and rats and sacrificing and cutting themselves up and tying themselves in knots and calling it yoga and transcendental meditation. And now you can do the same thing as Lamy, all these people sitting around starving themselves, calling themselves soupies, they're hitting themselves with whips and slapping each other into a frenzy. And then they go out and transport all this anger and all this absence of all this void of truth into violence and terrorism. And now they terrorize the world. Are you talking about us? I'm telling you, we started the walking. Sheikh Daoud was with us all the way. And that same brother Talib Daoud that was against the same white Farad years ago. And that's the man who gave me this direction. I was never one of his followers. He was my mentor. I'd go there, but I had my own congregation. And he told them, go join that man. Come into me. He is the savior for this time. They just didn't want to do it. And we walked and we walked. Yes, yeah, stay sweet, far, but we walked. And we got there, and we sat there, and we listened. And I shook my head. And the brother looked at me and said, what's up, Pop? And I said, these Pakistanians, Hafiz <laughs> Makbul and his little flunkies and his cronies, they're not here to help our people. They're here to poison them. They're here to enslave them, to make them worship their image. And lo and behold, Sunni Muslims shaving their mustaches and burning their foreheads and walking around with little Pakistanian hats and Pakistanian clothes had no identity. They're not Pakistanians. You can put all the Pakistanian clothes on you want, you still won't be a Pakistanian. Let me tell you a funny little joke. This joke is about a man, a brother standing there in the uh, bus terminal. He's waiting in the bus terminal, right? And he's just standing there, and he sees a little machine in the corner. The machine has a little card like a fortune teller in it. So the brother looks and he watches, and over comes a man. A man sticks the coin in, and bing, out pops the card. And the card says, you are an Italian. Your name is Balani, you know? And uh, you're on your way to New York, and your bus is at 6 o'clock. And the guy says, wow. And the brother reaches over, looks over, and says, let me see that. And he says, that's true. And the guy says, that's true. And he walks away. My brother says that, that skeptical look Nubians always have, you know, and, and so here comes a um, Chinaman. Chinaman walks up, he drops a little coin in there, goes clean, card comes out and says, um, you are a Chinaman, your name is Wong, right? Uh, you're 5'3", and you're on your way to Boston, and your bus is 5 o'clock. And he brother, let me see that, and right, come here. You got to look at that, he said, that's interesting. He says, that's true, the Chinaman says, yeah, it's true, yes, yeah, true. Said, wow. So brother's boy standing there, here comes a Native American with a hood on, the feathers, the whole thing. He walks over, sticks the coin in the spin, and out pops the card. And the brother and the brother looks and watching, you know, skeptical niggas as he's woman. And he says, You are a Native American. And your name is Blackfoot. And you're five ten, and you're on your way back to the reservation in North Carolina. And your bus leaves at one o'clock. His brother says, heavy. So the brother runs over, let me try this. He sticks his coin and goes, bing, and out pops the car. It says, uh, you are a Nubian. Your name is Josh, and you're 5'10", and you're on your way back to Brooklyn, and your bus is 4 o'clock. What's it going to How are they doing? He goes behind the machine, bangs on the machine, looks under the machine, trying to see where it came. He goes behind the next wall, stands there, shakes his head, calls it the Native American. And he takes his cloak, let me borrow your cloak and your feathers, and he puts his hood over, cuts over his head real close, you know, and hides his eyes and sneaks back over to the machine and sticks a little coin and goes, cling. The card comes out and it says, you are still a Negro. Your name is still Josh. You're still 5'10", but you didn't mess around with your skepticism with this machine, and now you have missed your bus. That's what's going to happen to you people. The same time, you're a critic of the man who sent you. I say all gratitude is due to all of y'all who are Allah in the person. And it gives me great pleasure to stand here in this great day and time to bring you this message of right knowledge, right wisdom, and the right understanding before the great and dreadful day which is upon us now. So I'll do my best to reach out and answer as many questions as I can. Because the hourglass is almost empty. Everybody take a listen to this, but this is your own language. 
Any insight, something to you. Abdur kul salutat wa fakir ibamul al kulub. Salutat shil al nasurat. Ja ayla wahid al iliyun alazi izurab shil al alumat. Na bamul nazbilua al wajib ant alana. ليا نصف ال وسق بام البي الغروب وهذه جور غيوم يا ربي نا نبريع أنت ليا صون يدك فوقنا ليا غيوت الغيوت هاتشيل الفروق شيل حينا ربنا وعزنا بام الخطو من فضلك أحرضك باركات وغافرس عهلنا أنت أفا الفقد واحد ذيك يقول باؤتنا هج تعبعات شيل النابويات وفي اسم مخنا حمل عالا begin all prayers and thinking by using the all these are the salutations of the eighties oh heavenly one most high sustainer who is the sustainer of all the boundless worlds we do accept the duty you have laid upon us to clean up the filth made by the non-submitting fools oh my sustainer we beseech you to keep your hands over us to control the strings of the courses of our lives oh sustainer and if we do wrong please shower thy divine blessings and forgiveness on us you are the only one that can raise us true followers of the new bearers. And in thy name, we carry on. That was not Arabic he was listening to, and that was not Nubic he was listening to, or Hebrew he was listening to. That was Nuwapic, your own language. Just recite it. Learn it. Eventually, we'll be chanted. And that was what we used to call the anthem of the Ansar. It was in the back of every book. Everything is being translated for you into your own language. Learn it and speak it and be proud of it. All right, man. Any questions? Yes, with no disrespect intended, Dr. Malachi New York, I would like to ask some questions. Can you please explain these two massive variety Muhammad, one being an Arab and one being a Caucasian? And his apology from 1990 from the Ansar Law community. And what will Minister Khaled in his comments? Please, I just want you to explain it. That's a very, very interesting subject. I hate to touch on it because there's been so much controversialness about it. Especially in cases of me. It's all right when anybody else talks about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad or everybody else talks about Master Far Muhammad. I mean, when Siraj or Hajj, who was known as Jeffrey X, broke off and spent lecture after lecture and traveled around the Arab world talking about making Islam, and Ms. Louis Farrakhan, nothing was done to him. I mean, nothing was said about him. I mean, the brother Galal Phillips, before he even started talking about or writing a book about me, was spending a lot of time talking about the nation of Islam and trying to tear them down and writing books about them. Nothing was said about him. The nation of the five are sent to the dog of the earth now. A brother from inside there called Clarence Stilton X breaks away from them. You listen to this? He breaks away, takes over the position of God, calls himself a law of pudding, organize a whole little group of young Puerto Ricans up in the Bronx, start a whole new thing called the Five Percent, taking out the lessons of Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and, I mean, you know, his followers are running around right now on the internet, and they're brothers, and they're relating together, they're relating and building together. But me, it's a personal thing always with me. I'll tell you why. It goes back a long way. I intimidate people because I deal with facts. Not bother people. But you people want facts, don't you? That's what else you give us the facts and truth. I may not be liking but I do, but I got to teach the truth, don't I? What else am I here for? But all these other people, they want to presuppose the truth and play games, gather lots of people and look good, put on costumes and look good. But what about what they have to say about your soul and the plans of the devil and what he's planning to do with you? They ain't talking about that. Are they? Constantly they repeat to you, white man did this, white man did that. We got more black devils than there are white devils. So they can miss that now. I mean black devils. I mean, I don't even know. I don't even know. Um, Spook the shop beside behind the door. I mean, brothers with apples infiltrating the organization and working with you, smiling in your face, praying with you, and they are the devil. I'm not just talking about infiltrators working on FBI and OCI. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the nigga who walks around causing problems. He don't know nothing. All he's trying to figure out a way to make some money off some people. He ain't out to sacrifice his life. I call myself a lamb. Why? Because I, for years, was hated. I went up against everybody. I didn't always speak out. I was just 
one of the brothers there teaching and trying to raise a new nation. But then they made a major mistake of touching on my personal life. And that's when I started coming out. And now that I've come out, I'm hated by everybody. It's not going to stop me. That's why you call yourself a lamb, because you know you're a sacrificial man. You take that chance. I'm not going out there and talk about this. All the life when I say, don't mess around talking about this government and what you're going to do. You ain't going to do nothing to America. Stop dreaming. You ain't got nothing you can do to the powers that be. But you can do something for yourself, and that's what he said. Do something for yourself. So that's a very touchy subject. And I can get more detail into it. You know and if you really want me to, y'all want to hear more about the philosophy? Right, because what happens is, last time when I tried my best to be a nice guy and break away in 1990 and write an apology, I got slapped in the face for it. Verbally, I got called names. He don't know what he's talking about. He's confused. One minute he's Turkish, next minute he's Syrian, next minute. Hey, I was with Sheikh Daoud Ahmed Faisal since I was 12 years old. Brother Omar took me in the State Street. And Sheikh Daoud gave me a card and he signed it and I still have it. And that was 1957, when most of these niggas either wasn't born or didn't even know what Islam was. They still was in the Christian church worshiping a white Jesus. Some fool will say, 1965, I took my shahada in State Street. Sheikh Dao gave me my name. He saw Abdullah Ibn Mubarakah Muhammad. He gave me that name. That was one of his relatives' name. His father's name was Khalid Abu Bakr. People don't know what they're talking about. That was way back in June 21st, 1957. Go back and get the records from 143 State Street. They're still there. And you'll see my signature. You'll see Chef Stigna, I was a kid. But he signed me in. But the brother walked me in there. I sat right there. And then, do you know who Chef Daoud was? Do you know his relationship to Farad and Farad, the real one and the imposter? Do you know that he was the man who owned the crusader? He was writing the greatest books in the latter part of his life. He died in the 8th, 9th he was writing a book through the 70s. He kept telling me, here's the manuscript, because I want to put this book on. Anybody who was around the state didn't know. He was upstairs cutting a book, and, and I was the one upstairs. Me and Rajah Sharif, Salahuddin, Amin, Abdul Wali, all these brothers who still stand for what was right. They listened to him. And he said, I know all I know about the Quran. I know him personally. It wasn't interesting to me. I was not interested in hearing about that in 1968, 69, and 70. I didn't care about it. I was busy worrying about building my own nation. However, he eventually gave me a certificate and made me his successor, a certificate I have with his here on today, which I was not interested in being a part of the Islamic Mission of America because it housed a whole bunch of Pakistanian demons and a whole bunch of confused Negroes who don't know what they want to be. So we broke off and we formed what we refer to as the Nubian Islamic Hebrews. Enough Hebrew to keep the Muslims away and enough Islam to keep the Hebrews away so we could do our own thing. Because we have a right to do our own thing, to be ourselves, to have our own stuff, as I say. So let me take you another step further, then you want to get into it. My apology was met with stupidity. Dr. Khalid and a bunch of other ones started talking about me, calling me a fool. They flashed this thing around, and they, they took my kindness for weakness. I'm going to take them another step. You know, there's actually three of them now, in view of the fact that Wolfie Muhammad has introduced a new one. There's a third guy that got coming out of Fuji. They call him Professor Abdullah Muhammad, who died in 1992. I tell you about him. He's a new one. He's a third one now. Now, what are you going to say? Warf D. Muhammad was raised there. He was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's son. And his son, Wali, who runs the radio station, and Warf D. Muhammad's best friend, who's called John Ramadan. These people got their own mission out there, and they're putting information out about a new Quran who just died in California in 1992. You don't know nothing about that. You don't want to hear the truth. You want to live a lie. Remind me, like I said before, the old story of the Last Temptation movie where Paul comes across the real Messiah and don't want to accept what he had to say. And I got my old Messiah. Paul went out and started a whole new religion. It wasn't called Christianity because the Nicene Council and them didn't meet in the 5th century and Antioch didn't take place until 300 years after Jesus was gone. It was still called Nazarene. But let me take you to another level on this if you really want to go. You know there was a guy, this is the real one by the way, and his name was Faul Abdul Ali Muhammad. They spell that F U. A.D. You got that? All right. Now check this. That's the name he was given at birth. Later on, he had to take on a new name. His name was Abdul Wali Farad Muhammad Ali. This is because he was involved in a whole bunch of illegal things. His birth date was 1891. That's right, 1891. Where was this man born? He was born in Palestine. What was his original nationality? He was Turkish by nationality. What was his religion? His religion was Islam. 
He was affiliated with the Morris Science Temple, Pan-Arabism, the Ahmadiyya, and the Ikhwani Muslim in the Muslim Brotherhood, and any other type of revolutionary group. He was basically anti-America. He was against America giving Israel the right to exist. His mother was Russian. Her name was Salima Hassan or Hussan. And her religion was Islam. His father was Syrian. His name was Abdul Ali Qudri al Baith. This is the real one now. Faud Abdul Ali Mohammed. He spelled it M-O-H-A-M-M-E-D, not what he used. But this guy left Palestine and relocated into Saudi Arabia. There he went to school. He studied there. He studied in Medina in Saudi Arabia. He didn't pop up in the United States until he came up in New Jersey and start bothering the Moorish Science Temple called the Canaanite Temple at the time. And that was in 1914. He was 23. He got arrested in 1929 for anti-American involvement. Sought the King Saud family of Saudi Arabia, which Fahad was one of his sons. Don't mix Fahad and Fahd, which is which is F-A-H-D, Fahad, who still lives today, who's running Saudi Arabia here in 1996, right? They funded this original one to come here. After funding his education in Medina, Saudi Arabia, the Islamic University. This man was very intelligent. He spoke 16 different languages, they say. I don't know how true it was. I wasn't there. Sheikh Daoud said he spoke fluent Arabic, French, uh, Hebrew, and quite a few other languages. He knew him personally. All right, now, y'all with me? You want me to keep going? I just did. It did. It did. It did. It did. And it's fast. It's fast that people don't want to hear. All right, now, look. He first appears in 1914. He's around age 23 years in New York, New Jersey. He starts to go to the Morris Science Temple, and he's causing a lot of problems. He messes around with them. He's actually on the picture, like I said before. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see a picture of him when he was visiting Chicago at that temple. Now, he stays around there until about 1917. I guess he's around 26 then. All right? Then he leaves there because Noble Ali wasn't going to tolerate him messing with his followers with this Arabic, something that they didn't have the knowledge of at the time. So he leaves there. Where does he go? He goes to Chicago. He arrives in Chicago around 1919. I guess he's around 28 years old at the time. Okay? Y'all with this? Okay. This is stuff he checked out. I had written this book. His manuscript that he passed on to me. Sheikh Yahoo was financed and funded by King Faisal, another Saud family, to eliminate that story and that gossip that was taking place because Saudi Arabia was both friends with America and this guy was, who was a terrorist roaming around his vision with this Palestinian guy, Fahad Abdul Ali Muhammad, was causing problems and saying he was from the noble family of the Quraysh, and saying he was from Saudi Arabia and that his name was Fahad. And the Saudi Arabians wanted to get rid of that, so they financed Sheikh Daoud, which I'll get into a little later, if you want. If not, I'll shut up. Because I intended to shut up before, and I mind my business from 1990 to 1995, when young ministers started coming out and trying to talk about me and the nation of Islam. I'm building a bigger nation. i got other things to do. We are always trying to move. We are going by leaps and bounds. We are touching people everywhere. But you want to pull and knock on the door and pull me back out of retirement. So here I am. See, I had much more of that story, but I just didn't put it out. Because it wasn't my business. I love the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I love everything he stood for. And that's it. I don't care about what the ministers feel what they think. They're just people like me. But they couldn't leave well enough alone. They wouldn't tell their followers it was a generous suggestion for me to back off, so they went and rubbed me the wrong way and now I'm back out. One more One. Okay. Right. You can see the picture of him in Chicago, right? He visited the Noble Dwali Temple. They have a picture of a celebration there. And it appears um, that he's in the upper left-hand corner. I think the, the, the date was October the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th, that's right, of 1928, right? And this was the real man calling himself a prophet. Let me establish something right now. Back then in the 30s, to call yourself a prophet was a very common thing. We had Father Divine, a prophet, Noble Dwali, a prophet. We had Earlene Gould White, the Seventh-day Adventist. She called herself a prophet. Charles Russell or Reza Ford, Joseph name Ford, called himself a prophet. Edgar Casey called himself a prophet. Back in those days, being called a prophet was a very common thing. And in the shrine of lodges, they reach a certain degree where they're called a prophet. It had nothing to do with the Islamic concept of prophet. Even Dr. Martin Luther King was referred to as a prophet. Noble Juali was called prophet, Noble Juali. It had nothing to do with Nebi and India, Nebihin and Nabawa and all of those things that mean so much today that Muslims are in this country from all over the place, pretending they hate the country, but living all luxury is going to Disney World and popping up America. And now they get down some ridiculous things like, what does the word Nebi mean? What did uh, Elijah Muhammad mean? He was a messenger. Was it a or was it a Rasul, a messenger? You know, 
Elijah Muhammad is whatever he wants to be to us because he came to us. He's ours. He's ours, sir. And we can take him and accept him for what we want to be. We don't care what you Arabs think about your desert concept. Now, right, let me get back on this point now. Do you know that this guy eventually caused himself so much trouble jumping from group to group, getting involved with all these different people, and he was still living in uh, 1921, he was still living in Chicago around 830, but he caused so much trouble with the American government that they imprisoned him in San Quentin. And eventually he was murdered in 1929 A.D. Same year, Claude, Noble Juali, and a lot of others were murdered. They were eliminating people. Project Ara, they called it. Getting rid of all these problems. Now this man here was so involved and so intense and influenced so many people, but they wanted a plot to go on. They wanted to control the minds of these people. So now he becomes Abdul Wali Farad Muhammad Ali. He joins in with the Ahmadiyya and the Ikhwani Muslim or the Muslim Brotherhood up until about 1920, as I said before. And he starts to visit all the different groups around Chicago. You with it? You with me? I don't think they know all this stuff. I think they just think they know. He's playing two ends from the middle. His main objective is to stir confusion in America. Right? They call him Professor Fahad mispronouncing his name, which is Fahd, which is a Turkish version of the word Fahd, not to be mistaken again, like I said, with Fajr, but early in one play, or Fahd, or obligatory as opposed to Sunnah, not to be mistaken, which was mistaken because the imposter didn't speak Arabic and he passed on to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad a lack of Arabic and the nation of Islam didn't study Arabic, so they got the names all confused up and got all the characters all confused, and that worked to the benefit of the government at the time they was trying to move everybody. So now he becomes known as Professor Ford, and you can find the name Professor Ford right inside the books of Noble Dwali. He makes reference to him there. And Noble Dwali, in case you didn't know, existed before the Nation of Islam. He had the star in question before the Nation of Islam. He didn't only have a Moroccan flag with a five-pointed star, he also used the five-pointed star and crescent. He had the fez before the Nation of Islam. He used the words sun, moon, and star, and freedom, justice, and equality, and all these things before the Nation of Islam even existed. All right. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, of Egypt. Now, they were founded by a guy named Hassan al-Banna, who was really from the Wahhabi sect, influenced by the Saudi Arabia. All right? This Muslim Brotherhood is the same one today. They call them the Ikhwan. Now they're the same ones responsible for them. Sheikhs blowing up those buildings. They are the Rabbitat, the Darul Iftar. They are the spread of all of this terrorism worldwide. This is a plot by these demons. All right? This Sheikh Hassan al-Banna, found his branch of the group in Egypt as the Wahhabi sect in 1745. This plot goes back a long way. He proclaimed himself as the reformer, a form of Mahdi, a form of Messiah to Islam in Egypt. At the time, gradually, them titles drifted away and he just became the great Imam or the great chef. But originally, he considered himself a Mahdi. And he had his own interpretation of Islam and the Quran, a very fanatical interpretation which breeds these demons who feel it's all right to go around and terrorize the world. Right? You understand? This is deep. It came from Egypt over here, from Palestine over here, from Turkey over here, from Morocco over here. A bunch of Caucasians who had invaded the real religion, Islam, when it was in its first name purity, and had poisoned it. Now it's in the hands of a bunch of demons, and then they gave it back to the Nubians as if it was dead. <laughs> and they accepted it. Right? At least when we were saying Sahara Allah, we identify with the Sudan, with people who were good, that were Nubian like ourselves. He wasn't going around running up on the Pakistanis, running up on the pale Egyptians, and running up on the Turkish, and running up on the Syrians, and running up on the Saudi Arabians. That wasn't our way. And that's another reason why I wasn't like, and I was always called a racist. Because I was running a race for my race. I cared about me, I cared about my kind, and that made me the troublemaker. Believe it or not, I got more flack from Nubian brothers in America than I did from any Arabs. Alright, so two years after he joined the Muslim Brotherhood, and also involved himself with the Ahmadiyya, which was around 1921, around age 30, this same guy, Fawad Abdul Ali Muhammad, this is the real way I'm talking about, right? And he started causing all kinds of problems in American government. Right, he joined this anti-American group known as Pan. Arabism, I think they call it, Pan-Arabism. Uh, they are a, a Palestinian group, which is a Hezbollah and all those guys. They're a revolutionary movement, typical of that time, right? They were very angry. It was about the fact that the United States was pro approving the plan for Zionists and was giving them their own state in the United Nations. So they planned to sneak in here and disrupt this country's system. 
and also it linked into the Nazis, because the Nazis were the only ones who would finance them, because the Arabs didn't have no money. So there is a Arab, Turkish, Syrian, Nazi involvement here. Okay, let's go on now. One of their main bases of establishing stuff is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. You can go look it up. They start setting up Islamic universities there. All of these are part of the plot. Now, because of Fahd Abdul Ali Muhammad's involvement with all these groups, he managed to get himself arrested several times between 1926 and 1929. Upon his final and fatal arrest, which is in 1929, he went to San Quentin, that's said before, the penitentiary in California, where he was put to death. They eliminated him. Later, they came up with a plot to replace him with what I refer to as the imposter. Again, this was the first one who was eliminated. The real one, named, who now they call Master Farad Muhammad. Now let's walk on that. Let's work and see where that goes. The second one, the imposter, he arrived in Los Angeles, California in the year 1914 AD. Wallace Dodd Ford was his real name. All right, W.D. Fard. They also call him the prophet. Some people call him. All right, now check this out now. I'm going to be running on for a while, so you got to be with me. I'm going to give you a whole history right here. Which later he just became known as Fard. So he became, his real name is Wallace Dodd Ford, a bit typical British name. Then later on he becomes uh, uh, W.D. Fard. Notice, they know, he's not W.F. Muhammad like 1 to 36, but W.D. sneaks in there. Why all these name changes? Why all these shit? Because people are changing. And y'all talk about my name changes? I'm the same person. All right, now. He gets into Chicago out of, from, where you coming from? Portland, Oregon. That's the, the police record stadium. Uh, they have him registered as that being his place of birth. All right? He was of American birth, an American citizen, and he was born in the year 1891 A.D. Although they list him as 1877. Just look at the picture on the wall behind the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and calculate the date from 1877 to 1930, 1931, all the way and see if that man is that age. Wallace Dodd Ford was born 1891 A.D. And he, with the help of the FBI, assumed the name of the original, or the personality and birthday of the original one who they eliminated. They needed him to infiltrate the organization amongst those who didn't know him. He was born in Portland, Oregon. Nationality, white American. Color eyes, brown. Color hair, brown. What was his blood type even? He had type A, they call it an anti-B antibody. Right? That is the blood of a Caucasian, not that of a Nubian. What was his religion? By birth, he was a Mormon by birth. Affiliation, Nazism, FBI, and a double agent. Now this is the Caucasian one, the one that's being circulated as the real one. What was his mother's name? Minnie Z. Ford. Where was she from? She was a British living in Polynesia. What was her maiden name? Dejan. What was his father's name? Alfonso Dodd Ford. What was he? A merchant seaman of British birth. Did I do my homework? <laughs> this is the one. It is Wallace Dodd Ford. He himself married had a wife named Hazel Burke. They had a son, his name was Wallace Max Ford. He was born September 10th, 1938 in Los Angeles, California. These are things Sheikh Zahu got on record. He brought out the Crusader and all the investigation papers, the police records, the files, the blood sites. He did this stuff. He was giving it to me and I didn't want it. I was not interested in it, but it was given to me anyway. I don't want to be the one that makes all this stuff clear. It's not my business. But they made it my business. I said in 1999, I'd give up. Let me go about my business. But no. <laughs> They got to wake up the sleeping lion and start the name calling. So now you want the rest of the information? I'm going to give you what I was given. You have a right not to believe in my, what I refer to as mentor, Sheikh Dawood, and I have a right not to believe in your interpretation. But mine is that that with facts, and yours you're not producing any facts. Because you can't tell us where your father went, when he was born, where he was born, his mother and father, all you got is a bunch of mythology. I get you with dates, facts, blood types, and even have his fingerprint on record. This can be gotten, you can assess this. But you don't want to hear it. I understand. That's what blind faith is about. All right? So now, once he relocated, he left Portland, Oregon around 1914 at age 23. And he started to reside in California. He started getting arrested there. He was a troublemaker. By 1918 to 1926, he had three different arrests from 20, age 27 to 38. Sentenced eventually to life and made a deal with the government. This deal got him his release in 1929 at age 38, about the age of the picture on the wall, when he was to assume the personality of the devil. Did the Honorable Elijah Muhammad know him the original? No. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was affiliated with the Ahmadiyya group. He had an uh, Ahmadiyya name, Ghulam Abulam. Everybody knew that. They know he wore Ahmadiyya cap. 
They knew he was involved with the Moorish Science Temple. His followers was in that, but they know he was a Moorish Science cap. He used the Yusuf Ali Quran first, and he shows him holding picture of the Yusuf Ali Quran, which is a Sunni Quran, and then he switches over to the Ahmadiyya Quran, which is a Quran that Minister Louis Farrakhan has used today. There's some affiliation there. What's the nature? If you want me to go on, then I can go home. You want to hear the next one? You want to hear? All right, so I'll do my best. Okay, here. Now, so he first pops up in Chicago at the Morris Science of claiming to be the reincarnation of Noble Jew Ali. Right, this is in July 4th, 1939. He's about 39 years old. He disappears around June 30th, around 1934, at age 43. This is when they say he left. Why did he leave? We'll get into that. You see, on August 15, 1959, a newspaper article appeared in Chicago News called The Crusader. The headline listed Master W.D. Fard Muhammad as another of Wallace Dodd's false aliases. All right? As a Turkish ex-agent of Adolf Hitler Nazi, this paper was repeated. The article was put out again around August 1st, 1959. Who do you think was behind these articles? Chef Daoud. Who was Chef Daoud? A Moroccan fez born Nubian. Who influenced the Moorish Science Temple? I know. I was with him since 1957. Don't say, Imam Isa took a Sahara on the look and his face. You lie. And you know you lie. And I got documents to prove it. But you don't want to see the documents because you'd like to shut my mouth because you don't want to know the truth because if the truth will make you free enough to come down because that is here. All right. Now, who wrote that, they said? It was written by none other than my mentor, Haji Talib Daoud. That was Sheikh Daoud's real name. Many people don't know that. He later changed his name to Chef Daoud. He was born, check the date, in 1891, and he died in 1980. And I was there. And his brothers, if they're honest, will come forward and tell you. We was in state three, we were at the hospital with him. And he pointed and said, you're the man to take over. And he gave me all his manuscripts and said, you do this here. I don't want him to do this. It wasn't my business. I was not concerned with a man that, was, that had left in 1934, him back, I mean, 1970, worrying about after coming out of a 1960 revolution, what to do with my people. All right, now let's check out, as you know him, whose real name was what? Haji Talib Daoud. That's right. All right. He known later as Chef Daoud. Everybody knows. Now, when was he born? 1891. He founded what was referred to as the Islamic Mission in America. He was an advocate enemy of the man who was the imposter. He knew he was pretending because he was very close to Fawad Abdul Ali Muhammad. Why? Because both of them were funded by the same family, the Saud family from Saudi Arabia. He knew him. He's the one who suggested he change his name to Abdul Wali Farah Muhammad so that he could stay the heck out of trouble. Sheikh Dawood tried to help this guy, but this guy was just an angry, vicious Arab who kept getting himself in trouble until he finally got himself killed. All right? Want me to go on at this point? All right, because I'm getting out of way here. <laughs> At the time, Chef Dog owned two businesses. He had his own enterprise, one in Harlem and one in Philadelphia. Right now, in the year 1950, at age 59, he used his own money, because he had used, remember, in Saudi Arabia was from them, and he brought out that same paper called the Crusader. Don't believe me? Go check it out. Right? He ordered them same articles to be reprinted about Wallace Dog Ford, who they sometimes refer to as Wali, W-A-L-I. He had a whole list of names when he got arrested. All right? Now, see, when he put that article out, he knew this was going to cause a lot of problems. He knew this was going to cause a lot of people in America to be mad at him. But Shaq Dowd, if he knew him the way I know him, he didn't care. He was concerned with the truth. What are we concerned with? The truth. Our brothers and sisters that are being led by the wrong people, they don't want us to stop and correct them. While I see people gathering, I'm thinking someone's teaching the truth and they're not telling the whole story. They'll go from Savior's Day to Savior's Day and supposed to be a representation of Farah's Day and never do you give a full history. You have a mythological history about an original black man who's like having a white woman with seven demons in her which is confined, like I said before, right in the book of Luke, and cast the demons out and give birth to God and God had disguised himself. He was an honor like, he didn't look like us. God is disguised himself so that nobody don't beat him up, then he can't help me. <laughs> He can come through, come as who he is. I'm standing here, I'm a God of flesh, I'm as who I am. I've been teaching in 1970 and have withstand all of their threats. I've been abused by birds, but I, 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 they won't come out against me to deal with the truth. Because they know I'm right. They know I'm exact at all times. All right, now, a few years later, an article popped up in Los Angeles, California, the Herald Examiner. That's on um, July 29, 1969 claiming that black Muslim founder 
is exposed as white. Now why would Elijah Muhammad take the posture of denying the man in the article that was WD Fard, it was article implied. Muhammad Speaks wrote a rebuttal to the article. It was released uh, in Los Angeles, California, at the Herald Examiner, on July 29, 1963. And August 16, 1963, he released it, right? They answered the claim that the Nation of Islam offered $100,000, right, to clear up the charge if anyone can prove that that man, which is the picture behind the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, is that Nazi or that white man, that Caucasian, who is a phony. Now, until this time, Chef Dowdy had nothing to say about it. He stopped because it was a fruitless battle. Now, Chef had all the investigators, all these people with him. He retrieved the arrest records on Ford. He got all the information. He even got the arrest record of June 12, 1926, which had the mug shots. That was on the docket, uh, I think it was C117924. Uh, you can go look it up, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. And identification. After doing an overlay, which is called morphing today, a technique that's used with computers enhancement, and overlaying each picture, I did this myself. I said, whoa, wait a minute. All of these faces are the same people. We start laying faces over faces and the lips and the eyes line up. Something is wrong. These are all the same men. And I begin to wonder why is the nation of Islam denying the man that was supposed to be their savior? Because they did not know that he was the imposter. They thought that he was the real one. They were fools. And it can happen to anybody. But you've got to be able to face it and go on. Again, the plan was examined. All threats that included Marcus Garvey, Dus Ali, Daddy Grace, Father Devon, Charles Rutherford, Tazi Russell, uh, even Joseph Smith of the Mormon. They were getting rid of him and Ellen Gould of the, what do you call those people, the Seven Day Adventist. And Nova Jolie, Claude Green, and of course they got rid of the main man, Farouk Abdul Ali. Muhammad. He was eliminated. Many other people died whose names are not mentioned, like I said before. It's not only about the nation of Islam and their story, it involved a whole lot of people and all of us in America and how all of our leaders back then in that same era were being eliminated. It's deeper than just you people. Who was behind it? A group of beings or men referred to as Black Angels. You can find the book. Black Angels written by, I think, a Stalin Hub. It's a true story of what really took place and who really controlled the Islam, but he had to print it as a fiction because they wouldn't let him print it as a fact. Who are these black angels? You really want to know? Yeah. Uh, they also call the guardians of the four wings. Some deep stuff going on here. It's a major plot. <laughs> God, I'm going to do my best now. You ready? The names were, as you find it at page five, Isaac Payne, Jacob Robb, who's also known as Yaqub Rab. Joseph Malcolm, who's also known as Yusuf Malik, and uh, Michael Solomon, who's also known as Mikhail Suleiman. This was those four that was recruited to control the nation of Islam. Since Fah's departure in 1930, these men had devoted themselves to a sacredly guiding the nation of Islam in a direction that they thought would best suit the leader, Elijah Muhammad. And Elijah Muhammad was unaware of this secret movement moving behind him. The Nation of Islam literature frequently mentioned 24 scientists or imams, even call them angels. Sometimes he speaks of seven angels walking around, the most fierce, has his foot in the land and one in the sea. Right? And these men had the ability to control the history of the world in advance, they would say. And it was hoped that the guardian angels would be the fulfillment of these 24 scientists. They gave the impression that they controlled things. It was agreed that the Nation of Islam were to become the most dominant, influential black group in America. See, they were clean-cut, bow-tied, clean-shaven. They were non-intimidating. Now, long before they started putting on FOI uniforms and, and, and uh, the women started wearing those garbs, they were just, you know, another Nubian group. So they were not really intimidating in appearance by far. And if you look at some of the brothers today, they're clean-shaven. They look more American than people that consider themselves anti-American. The first thing they had to do is they had to take control. It became important for them to control the nation of Islam so they can control the direction of which it went. And that way they could control all of it after having eliminated all of the leaders that was a problem to the government. Right? This brings us into a whole nother time. So now you see we had two for us. We had the original, the Palestinian, Turkish, involved with Nazis, and then we had the imposter placed in there to cause the problem. They succeeded in eliminating all the black 
leaders, and they chose a man that they said was not very educated, but and made him the leader. And all the people that opposed Honorable Elijah Muhammad coming into leadership, who was called Kareem at the time, they got them out the way. All right, the movement is going on, it's starting to grow, things are starting to look good. However, Elijah Muhammad finds out that the man is not the real one. How do you tell all these people? All these thousands of followers, all this money, banks, planes, jet, I mean, all the time he just turned up, fine, it wasn't, it, that man who came to me was, was not the real Farad. Not the real, it couldn't be done that way. He had to come with another whole scheme. The scheme was to take the son, Warab D. Muhammad, and put him in charge, because he would pull all these people, because Uncle Elijah had a good heart. He wanted to pull all these people in the mainstream Islam, and that would be it, before he died. They got him off his dying bed to make the theology of time. Right along the early parts of the 70s, from after 72, 73. He's gone out then to teach them and weave it back in. But they had another plan. He had a friend he used to communicate with from Pakistan, who was from Uzzah Ahmadiyya. He referred to him as Professor Muhammad Abdullah. Uh, he was born in the uh, province of Punjab. This is the same one who died on June 18, 1992, um, in um, Haywood, California. All right? This man was communicating with Uncle Elijah Muhammad since 1947. He finally came to the United States in 1959. All right? The plot was to make this man far. To make people think that he was far, and they can convince him he was far, he would go to the podium, and he would tell people, and he was all together, they would be able to pull everybody over. Warab D. Muhammad was in order because he was already Sunni. Sunni eyes because he was educated amongst the Arabs in Egypt. So he was very easy, it was a part of life. He was the man to be the one. Minister Louis Farrakhan didn't know nothing about the plot and couldn't be used. He could be a problem. So they had to suppress him. If you look at that slavery day in 1975, he's the only one crying. Everybody else knows what's going on. There's some sad people, but he's the only one that's really torn down. Why? Everybody else knew. They already cried two years ago. They knew what happened. All right? But he didn't know. And he thought that he was going to become the leader of this organization when the organization was trying to mellow itself down. Well, D. Muhammad was put into position. Everybody knows he was not in the temple. He did not agree with the Farad story. All his life he was an opposer. It's in the history. Just go read it. You can see it. But, no. They select him on that Savior's Day in 1975. Hold him up. Everybody cheers. And they all get up one by one and agree that he is the man that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said they should follow. Yet, nowadays, they're not following him and they consider what they're doing right. When they all admit it, you go back and look at the tape out their own mouth from Muhammad Ali to Jesse Jackson to Farrakhan to all the sons and even the brother of Donald Elijah Muhammad was there. And they all, the top ministers, admitted that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they heard say out their own mouth that they should follow Warwick D. Muhammad. Yet, they're not doing it. So they didn't follow what he said. But, but we're wrong for telling the true story about the thing. Same story that Warwick D. Muhammad is trying to tell you now. But they won't tell you that. That same guy they're saying now in the new papers, uh, Muhammad Abdullah, Professor Muhammad was from Punjab, he is the original Farad, he ain't the original Farad. It's another whole man they adding in. And talking to this man's family, because you know he's married, he lived in California, he had a wife and he had kids, he had three sons. He had a son named Saeed, a son named Zah, and a son named Akbar. Coincidence that the Elijah Muhammad's son is also Akbar, he was also educated in Arabic, it has nothing to do with the nation of Islam. No coincidence, look into it, find it out. Right? Warab Muhammad introduces him. He is Muhammad Abdullah. He's born in 1905. Where is he born? India, Punjab. He's not saying he's a Pakistani, Ahmadiyya link. You follow? They don't know much about his mother, they don't know much about his father. Right? He has, these, like I said, three sons, Sayyid, Zafar, and Akbar Abdullah. All right? Check now. One of his sons, or his daughter-in-law, his name is Zakia Abdullah, she is the granddaughter of Molana Muhammad Ali, who wrote the Molana Muhammad Ali Quran. Don't believe me. Check it out. If you want the real information, check it out. This guy moved to Chicago officially in 1950 and becomes a member of the Nation of Islam. He's going to help to bring this thing over. On June 18, 1992, he died in Haywood, California. Worldly Muhammad and them to this very day are teaching you that that was Farad. You can investigate it, you can look it up yourself. He is, they're putting this out now that that was the original Farad. There was three of them. The plot thickens. I've written a book about it and you'll be able to get it in thorough because I know it's not as clear because I've got to come out of my head here and it's not the same thing. But as near as you'll get to it. So right to this very day, you can contact either Wally or uh, John Ramadan or work right now tell you the truth. Why don't you want to believe someone who's sitting there? 
Why don't you want to follow the man that all the lies Muhammad told you all to follow him? Why? If he told you to follow him, all your ministers admit it right there in public and everybody. Why are y'all not doing it? And then you follow Farrakhan, who's taking you nowhere. He's taking you into a political arena, something he lies Muhammad told you to go into. He tells you he saw Elijah Muhammad after he had died, something Elijah Muhammad said can't come true. He tried to assume his personality, put on his clothes, change into African clothes, change out of African clothes. You know, can't y'all see that it's a money game, it's a political thing that y'all are getting tied up in? And it's not about no politics and politics, that's technology. It's about our people getting the truth. And there's a true story here. Whether you want to hear or not, it happens to be a true story. Shed Jal had the documents, he was there, and I was his student. You cannot deny that. But you didn't know that Shed Jal was the same man you could look back in your papers that was there opposing him in Boston. That's where Imam Isa, or as you call me, Dr. Malachi, you know, get this information. It's right and exact. Like it or leave it. It doesn't make no difference to us in ATM. Because we don't worship the Lord. We don't worship no white images. To us, he's a white man. That makes make you mad. But when I see him, I do not see an African. I do not see an Asian. I do not see a Native American. I do not see anything but a Caucasian. And I'm not worshiping no Caucasian. Not in 1996. No more tricks in 96. You can take it that way if you want to. I'm not going down that package. I respect the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He was one of us, raised up amongst us, taught us. He's the one who built that nation. Farah was gone in 1934. Everything that happened from 1934 all the way up until the time the Honorable Elijah Muhammad died in 1973. He built that there. He was the man behind that. That's the man I give my respect to. And don't fault me because I don't want to follow some guy who don't look like me. It's not my way. And I'm not taking my people down that way. So I'm saying that to say, if you people will leave us alone, we won't have nothing to do with you. Because we as HTM, the WAPO, the Nubian Nation, we are grown by leaps and bounds. You don't want to accept that I'm the man who's talking about. Fine. Step back. But hey, leave me alone to be about my stuff and get my job done for my people. We want our own stuff. We have our own language, our own culture, our own dances, our own food. Leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. But tell your ministers, I said, let's let it rest, because this is deeper than they know, much deeper. Let me move on to something else now.